You know, when I was young, I was an altar boy. I think I, I told you about that, right? In the Catholic Church. I was altar boy for so many years from the time I think I was in grade one until I became or until I was in fourth year high school. Long time. So I grew up memorizing the Lord's Prayer. At one point, I memorized the Lord's Prayer in Latin. Pater Noster. I don't know if you heard about that. And, and you know, at that time, I would recite this prayer verbatim over and over again in whatever situation I was in. When I was afraid, when I was sad, when I was guilty of something, when I was thankful, it becomes like a mantra or an incantation. Sometimes I was even reciting it, but my mind was somewhere else. Little did I know that God wants our prayers to be more intimate, to be more personal, like a son talking to his father, like a son communicating his needs to his dad. Sometimes we don't even know what to pray. Sometimes we just cry to the Lord and listen. You know, these past few days have been emotionally draining for me and for a lot of people because, as you know, last Friday night we had a viewing service for Brother William Mexico and yesterday afternoon was his burial. And maybe some of you were not really close to him, but you see, this is what the church is all about and I hope you can attend or if you can attend the celebration of life today at 4 p.m. at the center, it will be nice, you know. A church shares its other's burden. We grieve together. We mourn together. And this is where we apply what we learn in Bible studies and what we learn during Sunday services. That we should be there for each other, especially in times of need. Amen? Bible says a friend loves at all times, but a brother is born in a time of adversity. Sometimes when pain happens in our lives, that's where you see who your true friends really are. They stick with you. They stay with you. They, they, they grieve with you. You know, Jesus knew that we have the tendency to become over-familiar when we are praying. That's why He does not want us to lose focus on the more important things, especially when praying to God. And this is the reason why when the disciples ask Him, Lord, teach us how to pray, so Jesus recited to them a pattern of prayer which was later on included in the Bible that we read which is in Matthew 6 chapter or verses 9 to 13. So please stand and we are going to read from Matthew 6 verses 9 to 13 and remember church that this Bible is God's word the grass withers the flowers fall but the word of our Lord stands forever. Let's read all together verse 5. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans. For they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Praise the Lord for his words. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to call you Father. Thank you, Jesus, for teaching us how to pray. And may we always look up to you in heaven and not be distracted with the problems that we have here on earth. We give you the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, I've been a pastor for a while. Ten years, probably, to be exact. Being a pastor, one of the most difficult meetings that I can call is a prayer meeting. People don't want to attend prayer meetings. They try to shy away from prayer meetings. Bible studies is fine. Watching Manny Pacquiao fights is even you know, more exciting to most people. But prayer meeting, they don't like it. Or most people don't like it. Equally difficult is to ask somebody to lead the prayer. 
They have all kinds of uh, excuses. One time, someone in our church told me that he doesn't want to pray in groups because he feels intimidated and he is shy because some other people are very articulate in praying. Have you experienced that? There are people who are very articulate. They can use really heavy words, you know, biblical prayers, you know, they can cite verses, you know, from memory. And yet, here you are, you cannot just pray very long. All you say is, Lord, uh, thank you for this food. Jesus captured the issue in verses 5 to 8. You know, Jesus first taught us the right attitude and condition of the heart when praying. He said, we should not show off in verse 5. He said, we should go to a solitary place or small room in verse 6. And in verse 7, he said, we should not babble like pagans or use vain repetitions. Uh, in verse 5, Jesus said, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues. So, they love to, to stand on street corners. These are the Pharisees mostly, so that people can see how spiritual they look like. When they pray, they pray very loud. You know, so people can see and hear them. So Jesus said, no, don't be a show-off. Jesus did not say, if you pray. But Jesus said, when you pray. Okay, That means prayer is a command. It's something that God expects from us. It's not, you know, we just do it whenever we feel like it. So Jesus said, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. So he expects his followers to pray. We are commanded to pray. He's saying that don't be a show-off like those hypocrites. They love to show people that they are praying. In the outside, they are holy. In the inside, they are hello. Or confused. So don't be discouraged when others seem to be more prayerful than you are. Of course, I believe more people are sincere when they pray in groups. It's just that some probably are not. That's why others are intimidated. So in verse 6, Jesus said, listen again. He said, when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. It all boils down to the condition of the heart. This is, of course, pertaining to your personal prayer to the Lord. God wants us to go to a solitary place and pray. Communicate just between you and the Lord. But sometimes we have to pray in groups, and that's fine. But the Lord is talking about here our personal prayer time. He wants us to go to a solitary pray, place like what Jesus did when he was here on earth. He goes away, away from the crowd and he prayed sometimes even overnight. He wants us to have an intimate time with God. And thirdly, in verse 7, Jesus said again, When you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. So this is what I was telling you earlier. I was reciting the prayer over and over again. Just like babbling. Vain repetitions, that's what they call it. So we just don't recite words over and over again to the point that we are just like babbling. Meaning, it's not coming from our hearts anymore. There's no more intimacy. So in verse 9, Jesus said, this is how you should pray. Not what you should pray. So it's not something like we have to memorize and repeat over and over again. It's a pattern that Jesus gave. The Greek word for how is in the manner, therefore. So it's not a set uh, prayer. It's a pattern. Okay? In Matthew 6, verses 9 to 13, well, it's popularly known as the Lord's Prayer. We got, we got used to that call, but it's more appropriate to be called the Disciples' Prayer because it's a manner of prayer given to us by the Lord. And we are the ones praying, not the Lord. Maybe John 17 is more appropriate to be called the Lord's Prayer because John 17, the Lord Jesus is the one praying to God the Father for His disciples. But in this case, Jesus is teaching us how to pray. So probably it's more appropriate to call it the disciples' play, prayer. And if you know the King James Version, the phrase, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever is included in verse 13. 
But in the translation that we read, which is NIV, it's not there. So how did that happen? So people are saying, oh, I like the King James Version because it's more complete. The NIV, the NLT, the NASB, they are not. So why did the King James Version have more words in verse 13? Well, this is the story. And let's just remove the technicality so it's going to be short. King James Version was published in 1611 based on manuscripts available at that time. When you say manuscripts, these are bits and pieces of the Bible. You know, like the scroll of Isaiah, you know, all these kinds of documents, right? So the rule is the older the manuscript, meaning the closer the manuscript is to the real event, the more reliable it is. So during the time when King James Version was written, the available manuscript includes the phrase, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. But then, a few hundreds of years later on, when these NIV, NLT, NASB translations were made, there are more manuscripts that are older than the manuscripts that the King James Version used. And in those earlier or later manuscripts, it doesn't include the phrase, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. So the rule of translation requires them to remove that phrase because older manuscripts does not include them. Okay? So it's not because the, new, the newer translations are incomplete. That's not the point. The point is the manuscripts that they use, which are older, which is closer to the event, does not contain that phrase. So that's the reason. So let's quickly talk about the kingdom of God. You know, in the Bible, the kingdom of God and the phrase kingdom of heaven are interchangeable. The phrase kingdom of God appears about 52 times just in the four Gospels. And in the Gospel of Matthew, he used the kingdom of heaven more often, about 20 times. While the Gospel of Luke, he used the kingdom of God more often. But in the Bible, they are interchangeable. So there are two points that I'm trying to drive at. First, they are synonymous. Kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. Second, the kingdom of God phrase must be very important for it to be mentioned so many times in the Gospels, right? It's been mentioned over and over again. It must be very important. So we need to understand what is the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God, and I hope I won't confuse you with this, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is both an already and a not yet kingdom. It's both an already and a not yet kingdom. I'm going to explain that. So it means that the kingdom of God can either be a physical kingdom or a spiritual kingdom or both. Okay? It means that the kingdom of God is a present kingdom and or a future kingdom. It's a very wide meaning. So, already, let's focus on the word already. When we say the kingdom of God is an already kingdom, the kingdom of God has already come. So what is that kingdom that has already come? It's the spiritual kingdom of Jesus Christ, where repentance is necessary, and it can be entered into by being born again in Christ. If you receive Jesus Christ in your heart, in your life as Savior and Lord, you are part of the spiritual kingdom now, at present. That's why I say it's an already kingdom. Those who receive Jesus Christ, for example, today, from this day on, you enjoy eternal life. So this is what we call the already kingdom. The spiritual kingdom of God has already come for those who believe and receive Jesus Christ in their lives. The Bible says in Luke chapter 17, it says here, The kingdom of God does not come with observation. Neither will they say, look here or look there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. It's in your life, represented by the Holy Spirit. When He indwells the heart of each believer, 
the kingdom of God is with them. So, that's a problem of the Jews. They were expecting a physical kingdom. No wonder, remember, the mother of James and John, she was asking Jesus Christ, Hey, Jesus, can you place my sons in your left and in your right hand? Because they were thinking of a physical kingdom. They were thinking Jesus Christ will come, you know, riding on a majestic uh, war horse and he will fight against the Romans. But when Jesus did not do that, they were frustrated. No wonder they rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah. Why? Because they were expecting a physical kingdom. So, the kingdom of God is a not yet spiritual kingdom for most people. If you have not received Jesus in your life as your Lord and Savior, then obviously the kingdom of God is a not yet kingdom as far as you are concerned. Amen? The kingdom of God is not within you if you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you are a believer, a true Christian, the kingdom of God has already come. But it is still spiritual. There's another thing. It is also a not yet physical kingdom for believers. But time will come, listen to this, time will come where Jesus will physically rule on this earth during his millennial reign. One day Jesus will come back. He will establish his throne physically here on earth. That's what we believe. So the kingdom of God now becomes a physical kingdom. Dr. Goldsworthy gave a very good definition. He said, the kingdom of God is God's people in God's place under God's rule. Very good definition. It can be both the spiritual and the, the physical kingdom that I'm talking about. It's just a matter of time when the spiritual kingdom becomes a physical kingdom at the same time. So let's continue. So what does the prayer tell us when we say, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, heaven is the model of perfection because that's where God lives. It's the perfect example of holiness. Heaven is where God lives dwells so jesus wants us to focus on heaven when we pray he does not want us to be distracted with the issues of the world he wants us to store treasures in heaven he wants us to look up to heaven when we pray because that's where the will of god is he wants the will of god in heaven to happen here on earth that's why the prayer is like that your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So as we wait with eager expectations for the physical kingdom of God to come, because we are waiting for Jesus to come back, our prayer at present must be for God's will to rule our lives here on earth. That's why the prayer is like that. Lord, let your will be done because we are still in this uh, in-between phase. We receive Jesus in our hearts. We have the spiritual kingdom. But Jesus will one day return during his second coming where he will establish his kingdom. That will be the physical kingdom. In the meantime, Lord, may your will be done here on earth in my life. So you see kingdom of God and will of God, they are closely linked to each other. They are tied up together. If God's will does not rule our lives here on earth, then it only means one thing. Or maybe we are not part of the kingdom of God. So in the prayer that Jesus taught us, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, is a very, very important part of the prayer. We must examine our hearts sincerely. Do we really, really want God's will to be done in our lives here on earth? Because it's not an easy prayer. Like what people say, be careful with what you pray for. Right? Because God, God might answer it. As disciples of Jesus, praying for God's will means that we are committed to obey Him no matter what the cost or inconvenience will be for us, even to the point of death. 
So when we pray, Lord, may your will be done in my life. What is his will is for you to sacrifice your wealth, to sacrifice your relationship. What if his will is for you to lose your job or sometimes make a decision that is unpopular? What if his will is something that would require you to give up your lives for him? Last week, we had water baptism. And I'm so blessed and so happy that we're able to do that here in Maple Ridge Church because that is certainly the will of God. You know, the disciples of Jesus Christ lived with that prayer that Jesus taught them, that your will be done. They actually experienced the will of God here on earth. But sadly, well, not sadly, from our perspective, it's sad. Because the will of God for them means they had to sacrifice their lives for Jesus Christ. Right? Not one of those disciples died or buried like Kuya William at Forest Lawn. No. They all died horrible deaths. Martyrs. That's the will of God for them. I'm not saying God's will for all of us is to die as a martyr. No. God has a different will for each one of us. I just hope and pray that when God um, reveals His will to you, you would respond positively. Here's the problem. A lot of times when we pray for the will of God to happen in our lives, and then when it is happening, we try to resist it. We end up doing things our way, not His way. It's our will that is being followed. Sometimes the Holy Spirit is already prompting us what to do, but we still do what we want. And sometimes we already know that there's something wrong, we are still doing it. Do you know why? It's because of sin. Sin happens because we are still in the flesh. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 7, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. Paul said, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is the sin living in me. So the main reason why we cannot follow the will of God in our lives is because of sin. And we are still in this world. So how do we find or know God's will? That's the, probably one of the most common questions that I receive as a pastor. Pastor Amil, how do I know God's will? You know, something happens. Is it God's will? How would I know? It's hard to, hard to understand, right? But Paul gave the answer in Romans 12. He said, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. What does that mean? God wants us to have this transformation which emanates from our heart when we accept Jesus into our lives and we become a new person. We are indwelt by the Holy Spirit and He makes us capable of transforming. So if we are living in sin, if we continue to live in sin, it's going to be hard for us to know God's will. But I promise you, if you are obedient, if you are transformed by the Holy Spirit, if you have changed to be a new person, like a new creation when you receive Christ, I promise you, whatever is happening in your life is God's will. Whether it's good or bad, it may seem. Because the Bible promised us that all things work together for good to those who are called or serve the Lord and those who are called according to His purpose. Somebody died in your family, it's bad. But in the long run, it's good. God has something. God has a plan. You lost your job, it's bad. But in the long run, in His grand plan, it's good for you. You just don't know it yet. C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Great Divorce, he wrote, There are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, Thy will be done. And those whom God says, in the end, Thy will be done. What does that mean? God does not force people to go to hell. It's their decision to reject God and deviate from His will. 
The Bible says God is patient. He does not want anyone to perish, but for everyone to come to repentance. So when somebody goes to hell, it's their will, not God's. It's their willful rejection of Jesus that will bring them to hell. Chuck Swindle told a story about um, a father and a son living in Japan a long time ago. There was a young man who farmed a little piece of land with his father. You know, several times a year, the father and the son would load up, you know, an old horse-drawn cart with vegetables, and they go to the nearest city to sell it. The father and son had very little in common. The old man believed in uh, taking it easy, but the young man was usually in a hurry. He was more of the go-getter, multitasking type. So one day, they hitched up the horse, loaded the vegetables on the cart, and they started on a long journey. The son figured out that if they walked faster, if they kept going all day and night, they would reach the market early next day, and they'll make more money. So he kept on prodding the horse with a stick, urging the animal to go faster. When he kept on doing that, the father said, Take it easy, son. You'll live longer. The son argued, but if we get to the market ahead of the others, we'll have a better chance of getting good prices. So four hours and four miles down the road, they came to a little house. And the father smiled and he said, hey, that's your uncle's place. Let's stop and say hello. But we lost an hour already, said the, said the young hotshot know-it-all son. The father answered slowly and patiently, then a few more minutes won't really matter. You know, my brother and I have lived so close and yet we see each other seldom. So let's just stop for a little while. So the boy fidgeted and fumed while the two old men laughed and talked, talking away for another hour. So then they were finally on the move again and the man took turns in leading the horse. As they approached a fork in the road, the father led the horse to the right and the son said, the left is a shorter way. And the father said, yeah, I know, but you know, this road is much prettier. Have you no respect for time? The young man shouted. Oh, I respect it very much. That's why I want to pass through this left side where I can look at beauty and enjoy its moment to the fullest. The winding path led through graceful meadows with wildflowers and quiet waters. But the young man missed all this and he was agitated, boiling with anxiety. He didn't even notice how lovely was the sunset on that day. But the man breathed in the aroma, listened to the babbling brook, and he pulled the horse to the halt to a halt, and he said, Okay, let's sleep here. And the son said, This is the last trip I'm taking with you. You are more interested in watching sunsets than making money. And the father said, That's the nicest thing you have told me. Yes, I'm more interested in watching sunset, smelling flowers, and spending time with you. So a couple of minutes later, the father was snoring, and the young man was glaring back at the stars, and he basically was so restless, wasn't able to sleep. Before sunrise, the young man shook his father awake. Sorry, it's a long story. They hitched up and went on, and about a mile down the road, they happened to catch another farmer. And he was having a hard time pulling his cart out of the ditch. And the father said, let's give him a hand. And the son said, are you kidding me? <laughs> We've lost so much time already. Relax, son. You might be in a ditch one day and you'll need help. So let's help this man. Don't forget about that. So the son looked away in anger. And by the time the other cart was back on the road, it was almost 8 in the morning. Suddenly, a great flash of lightning split the sky and what sounded like a loud thunder followed. And beyond the hills grew dark and the old man said, Looks like a big rain is coming to the city, said the old man. So we have to hurry, said the son. We are almost or they must be sold out by now. Take it easy, son. You'll live longer and enjoy life so much more, according to the father. So it was late afternoon by the time they got to a hill overlooking the big city. They stopped and stared down at it for a long, long time. 
Neither of them said a word in surprise. And finally, the young man put his hand on his father's shoulder, and with tears flowing in his eyes, he said, Now I understand what you mean, Dad. So they turned their cart around and began to slowly roll away from the hill, no longer wanting to go to the city. That's the great city of Hiroshima, which is now a radioactive wasteland from the atomic bomb that was dropped by the American planes a few hours ago. What's the point of the story? We follow the will of the Father because He knows what's best for us. We can live longer. We can enjoy life to the fullest. We can experience the fullness of the kingdom of God if we obey His will. He knows what's best. Are you committed to allow the King to rule over your life? Are you prepared to follow the will of the Father and not yours? I know it's a tough call for most of us. But this is what we need to do in the meantime as we wait for the physical kingdom where Jesus reigns or where Jesus will reign. I know He's already reigning in our hearts and lives as His spiritual kingdom, Holy Spirit living in us. But since we are still living in this fleshly body, since we are still living in this world, we struggle. We experience hardships in life. And all we have to do is to ask that God's will come to us. And we do it because we are waiting for the physical kingdom of God. So before we close in prayer, I'd like to call Ram to minister to us through a song. So let's pray. And I just want you to ask yourselves, are you committed or are you committing this morning to allow the king to rule over your life? Are you prepared to receive the kingdom of God, at least spiritually at this point? Are you prepared to follow the will of the Father? If you are here today and it's your first time or you haven't truly surrendered your life to Christ, you may have been attending the church for a long time, but it doesn't matter. You may have been in a family of Christians, but you don't become a Christian by affiliation. You become a Christian because you made a personal decision to receive Jesus Christ. I would like you to close your eyes and bow your heads and say this prayer from your heart. And I promise you, if you receive Jesus in your life today, you shall receive eternal life. You shall receive the spiritual kingdom of God. So please close your eyes and bow your heads. Don't mind the person beside you. It's between you and the Lord. And I want you to follow this prayer from your heart. It goes like this. Heavenly Father, I come to you today as a sinner. On my own, I cannot do anything. I cannot save myself. Father, thank you because you have sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die for me on the cross. Father, today I open my heart and receive Jesus Christ as my Savior and as my Lord. And I know from this day on, I am part of of the family of God. I'm part of the body of Christ. I'm part of the spiritual kingdom of God. Thank you for this wonderful gift of eternal life. I pray that the Holy Spirit will minister in my life from this day on and help me to do the will of God in my life each day. Lord, thank you for this wonderful message that I have received today. Thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus. Thank you for the eternal life that he promised to give me. Now that I am part of his kingdom, I give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Praise the Lord.